questions. So, Matthew, please stay on stage. Uh, I have the uh, first chair er, for your, reserved for you, or no, the last chair actually on this side, okay. looking at the mirror. <laughs> And uh, I would like to ask Mike and, and Renee also uh, to, uh, to come back to the stage. Um, and uh, then we have Chris Hickman. Um, welcome. Uh, Chris is the Chief Security Officer at Key Factor. And uh, Chris will be here to moderate our panel discussion. Renee, who was just sitting here. So maybe you can get started with the introduction, and I think Renee will uh, join us soon on stage. Thank you. Hello. Hey, it works. Um, my name is Chris Hickman, Chief Security Officer at Key Factor. Um, walking in the uh, shadow of these giants uh, today, so uh, I am going to try to ask not dumb questions as we go, but uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to do this. I also invite our uh, folks who are online, please submit your questions. And if you had questions that didn't get answered in the first round, this is another opportunity to ask them. Uh, we will try to leave as much time as we can. Uh, we have a few people uh, up on stage. I'll ask you just if you wouldn't mind to reintroduce yourselves um, for everybody or those who may have joined online uh, a little bit late. So, uh, Matthew, why don't we start with you? Matt Campagna. I'm from Amazon Web Services. Mike Ellsworth, Entrust. Great. And uh, I think joining us shortly will be uh, Renee, and Renee uh, is with, uh, with NIST. So, we'll, uh, we'll get started here. And, uh, I've got a couple of questions uh, that have uh, jotted down, but uh, you know, I want to make sure that we, uh, we also leave time for, uh, for those folks who are, uh, who are in the room and online. So the first question I was going to uh, just ask, because I rarely get a chance to ask such distinguished uh, individuals uh, these questions. Um, you know, recently, there's been a lot of uh, publications um, you know, about crypto. Crypto seems to be becoming uh, much more of a hot topic these days. Um, you know, looking at it specifically, recently there was one that uh, claimed to break RSA uh, 2048. Um, I think it was a group out of uh, out of China. Uh, a lot of obviously uh, debate about the validity of that claim. I just wanted to, if I could, tap each of you for your opinion on uh, what your thoughts were around that uh, that claim and uh, and what you uh, what you think is interesting about it and what you think might be uh, sort of uh, a little bit too pumped up. So, sure. Um. So uh, certainly uh, when those, um, I'll say, papers that read sensational um, uh, come out, uh, it puts, you know, at Amazon that's a, a SEV2 and, and you get paged and, and you begin analyzing that paper uh, looking for, you know, is it, you know, what is the truth of this paper? And that's what happened uh, when, when that, that paper was published. We produced sort of our public speaking points on that. Um, and they, they basically netted out to, oh, well, you know, they're making an assumption here. Uh, I forgot the name of it, the, uh, um, uh, but, but the assumption that that paper was predicated on was still a, 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 a super complicated or high complexity problem to solve. And so while their result uh, is, is dependent on solving this other problem, uh, it's still unknown how efficient that or it's believed that that's still computationally infeasible. Um, so those things cause uh, a lot of uh, stress, uh, you know, both, both on the individuals at the companies. Uh, and, you know, it would be nice to see, you know, papers being vetted a little more uh, for, for just how sensational they, they sound when they're published. Please go ahead. And the <coughs> A good point to remember there is that we're concerned about quantum computers, but of course the classical attacks are still coming. RS, you know, RSA might fall to a classical attack before it falls to quantum. Or um, the recent, was it ECDSA psychic signatures where an implementation just forgot to check for the zero point? Like these, these things somehow still happen even to our tried and tested crypto, and it's a good reminder. And Renee, curious to get your opinion on this too. Um, the question that we were uh, just sort of contemplating is the recent uh, publication of uh, the fact that RSA 2048 um, you know, uh, claims that it was uh, compromised or broken in some respect. 
Um, you know, how does uh, how does NIST look at those, and what um, you know, what are your your opinions on those sorts of uh, claims that I think the general uh, impression is that they're uh, somewhat sensationalized? Um, the RSA paper, um, yeah, I saw that uh, paper. The the um, I, I want to believe that the press uh, uh, set, uh, made uh, kind of irresponsible um, announcement that it wasn't the intention of the, my Chinese colleagues to uh, tell the world that they could uh, break uh, RSA with a quantum computer with just uh, 300 and something qubits. Um, so. The, it's a paper that says, okay, if I have 300 and something qubits, then I can uh, break RSA, but it will take many thousands of steps. Um, so a quantum circuit has, uh, you know, a, a kind of width and a depth, and the, the probability that the quantum circuit outputs something that's not trash is uh, is uh, you know exponentially small in the number of gates, so they don't tell you the number of gates, which is many many hundreds of thousands. Um. And there's also, I think it takes a minute to warm up. There we go. There was also a um, uh, another uh, publication recently about uh, you know using a combination of AI and a few other tools as a side channel attack uh, against I believe it was Kyber. Uh, specifically, um, any thoughts to that one and, and where that leads? Um, you know, just uh, I, I know in in many circles it created again. You know, a little bit of uh, um, apprehension and reservation towards is post quantum secure? Uh, will it remain secure? Um, yeah, so I'm curious to get a little bit of thought on that. I'll take a stand on that, and then Matt might rip my opinion to shreds. But um, I mean, I see the a the world of AI assisted research in crypto sort of similar to AI-assisted medical research in that AI is accelerating the pace of research. You know, AI can evaluate millions of candidates and then whittle it down to the small ones to check by hand, but it, they're still, at the end of the day, algorithms, and they still have to respect the security proofs and the bounds established in, you know, in all the, all the literature. So my opinion here is that AI-assisted crypto will help us discover new attacks faster, but doesn't fundamentally change what those attacks are. I, I'm not. A, I mean, I was on vacation last week. <laughs> so, like, by the time I looked up again, you know, the, the, the news cycle had passed on that one. Um, so this is the paper that uh, attacks uh, Kyber, I believe, or, uh, on um, side channels. Uh, Right, I, I'm told that that's a good paper. I only had time to um, uh, read it not very carefully. Um, but it's an attack on the an, on the implementation of Kyber. So you know, you, it, it is not a break of Kyber. It is somebody proposed uh, you know, a uh, mass implementation of Kyber, and then they used uh, these um, these AI techniques and, and found a problem with the implementation. And that's going to happen. Uh, we've known that, that that sort of thing can happen for a long time. Yeah. And, uh, it also brings into, uh, you know, sort of similar, long, similar lines. Um, you know, we saw with the standard, uh, the first release of candidate algorithms, that site got broken almost, uh, almost right away. And I think you mentioned that, Matthew. Um, yeah. And, uh, and we're not going to get into it. But, um, you know, it did bring about some interesting uh, dialogue, right? Is, is, is the standardization um, uh, process working or is the standardized process broken? Uh, how did something get through that was, you know, immediately breakable? So I just, I, I wanted to, to sort of pose the question. I'm going to start with you, Renee, um, you know, in, in particular on this one. Um, is it proof by virtue of the fact that it got uh, immediately identified that the standardization process is working, or do you think that, that uh, it exposed some sort of weakness in the process? Um, well, I, th I, I think that the, the process worked. Um, 
in fact, it, this um, we're talking about rainbow. Is it? Uh, the uh, we we were concerned about this, and we it was borderline whether we would leave it in, uh, and then you know it got broken, and we sort of expected that that we thought that might happen. So it was not a big surprise to us. I would say the process is working. Um, the measure of you know how well crypto has stood up is not how many years it's been around, but how many person year hours have been spent trying to break it. And I think a, a competition like NIST really brings you know a wave of PhD students can you know do their PhD within the confines of the NIST competition. I think it's really bringing a lot more person hours of analysis to these problems. I think it's I think it's working. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of compliment NIST. I mean, I think um, by these algorithms dropping out at various stages, even psych after the round three, really emphasizes that, you know, I think NIST is operating as quickly as possible. And, and it, it says that they can't go quicker um, because they have to end the competition, or the process rather, with, with viable candidates that the community trusts. Uh, so, uh, as Mike indicated, the attraction of, uh, of the cryptographic community to focus that, that, that analysis on a handful of algorithms, there are a few uh, entities that can, that can command that attention, and NIST is one of them. Excellent. And, and so it, it, it also sort of, um, you know, another, another point that we're hearing a uh, lot of is, is NIST has traditionally taken a track, and, and I think as was mentioned earlier, of uh, you know a single algorithm, uh, one solution to solve one problem, um, which didn't work as, as was uh, as a, um, you know previously done. But I think it's going to raise an interesting problem, which is: Are all things going to be compatible with all things? How are people going to pick and choose the right combinations for their organizations? to keep them secure, and how are they going to remain agile within the maturing of those, um, uh, uh, if you will, of, of weaknesses that are discovered along the way. Um, you know, I'm curious to get your opinion on you know, going from kind of a vanilla to and, and chocolate approach, right? We had uh, RSA and, and ECC uh, to you know, having one of, of 10 or 15 flavors of, uh, of, of crypto available now and, and subtleties of key sizes and everything else. How are organizations actually supposed to uh, really take that into account and start to look at the things that are actually going to work for their organizations um, and, and remain compatible uh, across various different ecosystems, you know, um, not only within their own organization, but extending out to business partners and things of the sort. With difficulty. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 to borrow a line from my own talk, I mean, we all have an intuition about RSA 512 with MD5. We're going to have to, all of us, build that intuition of parameter sets going forward. Uh, Chris, I'll actually borrow something you said during the coffee break, that there's how many people on the planet right now have the expertise to sit down and choose algorithms for a PKI? Maybe it's hundreds, maybe thousands, single-digit thousands of people on the planet with that expertise, and all organizations are going to be competing for that expertise with difficulty. We kind of got into this a little bit at dinner last night too, right? Um, you know, the, the, the concept of, uh, of, of a lack of um, uh, skills generally, uh, cybersecurity skills being, uh, being in short supply, uh, uh, PKI and, and crypto uh, skills being even lesser uh, available for want, for, for using poor English. Um, you know, it, uh, it's gonna create a very interesting um, um, set of issues for organizations as they not only try to move down this, but then actually practically try to implement it. I'm curious, uh, you know, uh, Matthew, from uh, from an AWS perspective, I mean, you know, I think we'd all look at AWS as uh, probably having larger budgets and, uh, than, than most of us collectively in this room. Um, yeah, and I've looked at your timelines. If, if, if it's taking that long for an organization like yours, um, yeah, what do you see for your customers and, and what's the story that your customers are, are asking you to, um, to, to share with them about your experiences so far and what you anticipate your experience to be in trying to uh, uh, implement some of these things at scale? 
Yeah, I guess um, I'll start with Amazon has a set of leadership principles and frugality is one of them. And uh, uh, you know that, that, that applies to our engineering where we, we really are focused on uh, what our customer needs and what our customer wants. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, while the, the overall budget may be large, but like, you know, we're, we're fairly fr frugal in trying to stay agile to, to meeting that customer needs. We certainly hear from a lot of customers, uh, um, you know, a variety of different flavors from customers who are all in and they just want to know, hey, you're tracking this, right? So when the standards are done, I'm going to get the benefit of those standards in your protocols. And it's one of the reasons why we've been, you know, deploying now, uh, making sure it's in our pipelines. So not only that we know that it'll work, that we can forecast to our customers that we're going to provide that to them. Uh, and they can see that pipeline and track that progress. Uh, um, that's the, the majority of our customers want to know that. Uh, and then we have other customers that are using services like CodeSigner and, and have specific uh, timelines that uh, we're having conversations with and figuring out, you know, when do we need to offer um, these, hot, you know, signature schemes, new post-quantum signature schemes. Just out of curiosity, sort of a little bit of a, a, a switch here. Um, you know, we know um, we know the need. Uh, you know, NSA uh, uh, CNSA 2.0 uh, has brought out you know this requirement to have um, you know software and firmware signing uh, by 2025. Um, curious if if you can give us some insight. Um, you know, on what you see is going to need to change within ecosystems to support that. We've certainly talked about different approaches to, you know, hybrid and, and so on and so forth from the certificate side, but it's an ecosystem that has to support this. So curious if we can kind of go beyond a little bit the certificate and the, and the crypto and the algorithms and, and see what the potential impact is that uh, to, to organizations at sort of a larger scale. It's a big question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a cascading problem, right? I mean, we've several of the talks this morning talked about the lead time of a FIPS certification. I mean, this is not just NSA is, is U.S. Fed, so that means everything's got to be FIPS, right? They want, they want browsers and web servers, but all that's got to be FIPS at the bottom, right? And what's the lead time? 570 day average turnaround. And, and of course, the day that we can certify dilithium, there's gonna be a like 10 mile long queue of people lined up to get it. So like, you know, I, ex I expect that's actually gonna grow with when the bottleneck of PQ, I don't. And then you cascade that through. So then hardware, and then you've gotta get software vendors who are implementing on top of that HSM layer. And then you've gotta get, you know, if, if you're standing up a new publicly trusted CA, you've gotta get that web trusted, cause it'll be a new environment. Like, all of this chains along, and uh, s starting in 2024 and having it ready for 2025 is going to be a challenge. I guess I'll, um, the, d the pipeline for certification, I mean, I think it's gone through quite of a, a, a change, right? Like they closed FIPS 140-2, which means everybody jammed in FIPS 140-2 before the cutover. So uh, it's not clear that there'll be the same delay uh, in the future, um, uh, no guarantees, but it's not clear it'll have the same delays. Um, I think the best you can, can can do for things like firmware today is take the bet on the and put in the source code into the ROM for verification, and be ready to switch over to a hash-based signature scheme uh, once in the future. Uh, but that that comes with risks because now you're you're not loading that key in the factory uh, and the reliability of that becomes you, there's always a little breakage when you when you're doing field upgrade of firmware uh, to, to download the new root key so the comment sort of buried in there you didn't quite use the word crypto agility but don't <laughs> you're arguing not just move to something new but move to something new and be ready to move again well I mean when it comes to the boot ROM, you know, you're kind of stuck with it, right? Um, uh, so you could change your manufacturing, but um, otherwise you kind of have to do it at the time of manufacturing. 
Yeah, Renee, I'm curious if, uh, if you have any sort of thoughts on this from, from just the pure sort of standardization and, and crypto perspective, um, you know, hearing a little bit of a, how it impacts downstream, if, 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 if you've got some thought towards that. Um, it looks so complicated. That I'm, I, I, you know, I'm just a mathematician, right? I'm sitting in a room with 10 other crypto, and uh, I'm blissfully unaware of how messy things are beyond my work. Um, <laughs> Uh, and you know, coming here convinces me that I'm o I'm okay so far <laughs> where I am. Uh, but I, one thing I, I was curious, uh, uh, Matthew, that, did I understand you right that you, you you don't think you should we need to worry about post quantum signatures until we see that uh, quantum computers are within five years? Yeah, I would say like for for online systems that are you know always online and upgradable, like uh, then then. You know, yeah, I think you have time. As long as the software and, and the infrastructure is capable of supporting it, I think that's the longer, the longer uh, timeline, is to get those roots installed, get the software uh, deployed, uh, and verify that it's, it's all op operational. Um, uh, I think that's the longer timeline, um, at least for things like TLS, like, because a TLS server can just turn on uh, at that point uh, the post-quantum uh, verification. Now there are different environments like you know mutual TLS and, and that you know, you're going to have to deploy a little earlier. There's a couple obvious exceptions. We've talked about firmware signing. The other big one is EIDAS. If you're signing legally binding contracts, those signatures need to hold for decades sometimes. Yeah, the question is then can you upgrade them, right? Can you re-sign them uh, as long as you re-sign them, them prior to some you know, catastrophe date, we'll call it. And it does definitely, uh, you know, sort of beg the question for, you know, the average uh, organization, right? Uh, still struggling with, with you know, traditional, you know, uh, classical uh, uh, crypto and so on and so forth. I mean, how long is it going to take for, uh, for a, a medium-sized organization to even be able to get to a post-quantum ready state? Um, yeah, and it's uh, it's something we're hearing a lot. I'm hearing a lot as I'm talking to people. Is they're not even sure where to start today. And 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 all I think all of you have mentioned uh, in in your talk track, uh, yeah, uh, inventory, right? Inventory sort of being the take inventory, uh, figure out what you've got, figure out what the crypto is. Uh, just curious if if, if you have any um, uh, you know, sort of thoughts or, or guidance on how organizations actually even start that process because. Yeah, you know, even 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 step one uh, is is uh, in, to a lot of people very overwhelming. Yeah, I'll, I'll tie an answer to the uh, the OMB uh, um, letter on, on agencies having to inventory um, their high their crypto for high value high asset high value assets. Uh, that just caused me to panic um, because. You know, we have government customers, and 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 then I, when I think of inventorying, I think of every key everywhere, um, and its dependency on uh, the tree on on how it stays confidential or authentic, and that just you know, it's too large to fit, uh, uh, probably in an Excel spreadsheet, like it just would overflow. Uh, so just that. I was relieved when, when customers did come with the inventorying requests that the, the level of detail that they need at this point is sort of what's the FIPS module and what are the algorithms in it, uh, not down to that nuanced key. Um, so uh, I think I'm gonna have a better answer for you in like a year or a year and a half because in, it, you know this year we're gonna spend a lot of time inventorying our crypto services. Um, and, and building out migration plans for those, and following and trying to figure out, like, now do we have a repeatable pattern, uh, having done sort of the core nucleus and, and, the, and the protocols that I can repeat over another 250 services across AWS to make sure they have a migration plan. Um, so I'll know more at the end of the year when I have, like, productionized it. One, um, I wanna draw credit to the CNSA document, one thing I think it, it addresses quite adeptly is the difference between 
new things need to be using the post-quantum, which for some things they've said as early as 2025, and then all things need to be using post-quantum, which is you know at the earliest 2030. And I think that's a really important point, that 2025 doesn't mean kill. 2025 means start. And then the corollary to that is during that window, you're going to have a hideous mixture of old and new that all needs to work together. And that, I think, is, speaking as an architect, that, I think, is the fascinating part, is depending on the details of your environment, what you use crypto for, do you need old stuff talking to new stuff? Or is there an upgradable server in the middle that brokers those connections? Um, and I think that will really affect how you design your migration strategy. And, and I think, you know, um, when I was sitting uh, listening to, to all three of you, you know, one of the things that I was left with is, um, you know, it, it's not just a, you know, binary problem, right? There are things in the organization that we rely on today from a compliance standpoint, from a, you know, uh, a best practices standpoint. You know, the one that jumped into my head was SSL Intercept, right? Um, you know, great example of something that, you know, I, best practice should be using, so on and so forth. Is it even possible to do an SSL type intercept in a, in a post-quantum world? Um, you know, it, just bandwidth requirements of key exchanges, another one that keeps coming up. Um, so I think it, it, there's, there's still a lot of challenge uh, left ahead of us to figure these things out as we go, but I think it's going to challenge not only just a, the technology we use, um, it's also going to change the, the way we look at um, compliance within our businesses. Um, so with that, um, I was just going to see if there's any questions in the room, um, and if not, then are there any questions online? Uh, there's a hand up, if you wouldn't mind using the microphone. Yes, Gustavo Frederico, working with IOFINET. Uh, I'd like to know how, how can you actually know how fast you have to go? What are, what are the signs that the a quantum computer could break these protocols, and where where do you look at that? And um, yeah, where do you look for these for these signs of of, of threats? So I, I have a theory on that one. I'm gonna I'm gonna play this theory, but I'm more interested in, in, in as is everybody else, uh, uh, your opinion. Uh, I think when it happens, you probably won't know about it uh, initially because the people who are going to be successful in doing that aren't in the business of advertising their work. Uh, yeah, again, that, that's my personal opinion, but let's, uh, let's start with Renee. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, I, I follow the um, progress of, say, Google and uh, the Chinese. I, I, I don't know how to do that, how to follow that. Uh, but uh, Michelle Mosca in Canada produces this yearly report, and there you can see really what the experts, including those close to the uh, Canada implementations for quantum computers, how they are perceiving the threats. And it's interesting to look at them across the years, so how they become, it's a slowly uh, developing uh, confidence. Anything else, gentlemen? One of the talking points that comes up with hybrid crypto is either your elliptic curve or your post-quantum is going to be broken. Post-quantum may be due to bugs, elliptic curve due to quantum computers, but you might not know which and you might not know when. And so I think it would be prudent to design, I mean, obviously migrate early enough that you get ahead of it and design your systems to be robust so that either or can be broken and even if you don't know about it yet, you're still secure. It's, yeah, it's all hard problems, of course. I do like the hybrid approach. Um, uh, I mean, uh, in addition to following Michele Mosca's work, uh, which I think is, is, is a great service to the, to, to, to the community, um, uh, we have an internal uh, cr uh, quantum computing group that's building quantum computing services. And maybe that's where the budgets come in handy. Uh, like, I can call somebody and, and throw them a paper and, and ask them for the result uh, of what it means. And, um, one, one thing I, I uh, wonder about, I don't know what to do with this question, is what if we, you know, after 20, 30 years, we land at a place where, uh, sure, we have a quantum computer that can break 
RSA, but doing so costs a million dollars per key you know, to break. Uh, and, and without a prospect of that improving, if we land there, then what happens? I just don't know. Great, any other questions in the room? Any questions online? No? Oh. I keep looking this way, because that's the way I'm facing. Apology to everybody over here, by the way. Hey, uh, still Gabriel Spini. Uh, it's a question on, uh, well, the standards. Uh, it's a question that's been asked before, but I'm gonna ask it, say, well, not, not in this event, so I'm gonna ask it here. Um, so some people were there, we are producing too many post-quantum standards. Uh, now we have one CAM, three signatures, more coming from round four and, uh, and the new call. Uh, so can you comment on that? Is there a risk of having too many standards? We, we try to, to keep, to, to not, keep standards from proliferating, right? We, it, it's not ideal if we have many standards, I agree with you. And ideally, this process would have ended in one signature and one chem that was, you know, basically drop-in replacements for what we have now. But that's just not where we landed, right? Uh, so we have a safe, for signatures, we have a safe bet that takes, you know, a lot of resources. We have a pretty good uh, um, signature scheme in the lithium, but that it, it produce, has sizes that cause trouble for some applications, and we just had to offer this third one. Um, and then we, we're we concerned that we're putting all our baskets into uh, structured lattices, so that's not ideal situation either. That's why we have the on-ramp. Great. Thanks. And I think we have one final question. Uh, yeah. We do. Well, I don't know if it's final, but it's the last one for me. Um, I'm curious what the panel's opinion is about uh, worldwide adoption of standards. Like when you publish NIST, will every country follow, like China, Russia, especially for anyone with operations in multiple nations, or are we going to have a bifurcated world of PQC? that we're going to implement for domestic markets here, and then when you go to work with partners in other countries, you have an additional mess on our hands. Um, well, I kind of feel like I'm living in that world already. Um, I mean, as uh, AWS, we're, we do comply with uh, local jurisdiction uh, cryptographic requirements, and it requires us to build build that into our system, some degree of modularity. Uh, not, not exactly agility, but more modularity for, for those regions uh, that we can support that. Um, I'm hopeful that there's less and less of that going forward. Um, so I'm a big fan, you know, I'm, I'm you know, on, on sort of related to, to Gabriella's, Gabrielle's question is, I'm, I'm hoping we consolidate as we go forward. Uh, and that we build assurance in, in, in one of these schemes. Uh, maybe it's too early to know which one it is now, but uh, in five years, hopefully, we'll be resting solidly on one family of post-quantum schemes. I'll, I'll echo that. I mean, we're in that world today. You've got NIST curves, you've got brain pool curves, you've got the Chinese SM ciphers. I, I don't see that the current fracturing of PQ is worse than what we have today. And many thanks to NIST's open and public process that this may actually improve. There may be more consolidation on single algorithms going forward due to the openness of, of NIST. Uh, yeah, we can, we can only hope. <laughs> have no, uh, NIST can't even regulate within the US. We're non-regulatory, so. All righty, thank you. Great, and with that, I think uh, that's our time. And uh, Paul, I think uh, you're going to send us off to the uh, best part of the uh, of the day, at least, yeah, or this absolutely. part. Absolutely. So um, we have a uh, lunch out in the foyer here, um, brought by our sponsor. So thank them for for providing that sp uh, that lunch to us. Uh, we will be back in an hour, and then uh, we uh, will continue with Sebastian Paul. Uh, we will talk about the usage of a mixed certificate change for the transition to post-quantum authentication in PKI. And that is also kind of the trend in the afternoon where uh, we really start looking into, okay, how can we make this transition to this new world of post-quantum cryptography that we are living in?
So thanks for your time, thanks for the panel. Uh, it was a great uh, session to, to follow, I think very interesting for the people in the room and remote uh, that are participating in our stream. Uh, see you in one hour, thank you.